Historic five-point Trinitarianism is a reflection, in part, on the titles of Jesus. Consider six of them. In the beginning was the Word. What is Jesus? He is the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is a peculiar title, meaning it is not a title we use of the Father or the Spirit. The Father is not the Word of the Son. The Son is the Word of the Father. John 1.18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. I should pause there and make a note about translation. In the 20th century, uh, English translations really pulled back from using only begotten and uh, settled for one and only. You'll see that in the ESV. You'll see only begotten in the NASB or the King James. There is an article online. You can easily find it. It's called Let's Go Back to Only Begotten by Charles Lee Irons. And he is a part of a movement within evangelicalism right now to go back to the historic translation of only begotten. So Jesus is the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has made him known or explained him or exegeted him. <clears throat> John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Three more. Colossians 1.15, Jesus is what? The image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Hebrews 1.3, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And, if he, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And then finally here we have 1 Corinthians 1.24, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Early Christians reflected on the peculiar titles of Jesus and considered how they mutually inform one another. One central question is whether such titles only describe the Son as a creature or in his activity in the economy of salvation or whether these titles describe the Son within the inner life of the Trinity in eternity. Did Jesus become the Son upon creation or at the incarnation, his virgin conception? Or was Jesus always and eternally the Son? Was he begotten in the above sense at the incarnation or at the transfiguration or at his ascension? Or was Jesus the eternally begotten Son of of the Father, also called eternal generation. Did Jesus become the radiance of the glory of God, or was he always so? Did he become the word at some point of expression in time, or was this word, sorry, or was this true of him eternally even before creation? Think about John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then he goes on to create. If Jesus is the very wisdom of God, was the Father ever without his wisdom? Let me gently summarize five-point Trinitarianism. Firstly, with very brief words. The first point says that there is only one God. There is only one God. The second point says the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. The third point can be summarized using with and is not. The word is with God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father, and so forth. The fourth point, which we have now to cover, 
says that the Son, who is God, who is with God, is also of or from the Father. This is an order that cannot be reversed. The Father is not of or from the Son. Furthermore, the Spirit is from the Father and the Son. We will unpack that in a moment. The fifth point says that the Father, Son, and Spirit act in redemptive history in a manner that reflects point four. So God as Trinity acts as Trinity. God acts like God. He is not one God who acts like three gods. And the mutually ordered asymmetric relations of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Son being begotten of the Father and the Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son is an eternal reality that is reflected in redemptive history. The way that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit act is congruent with or according to or reflective of or appropriate to number four. God acts according to his nature. He acts according to the relations between the Father, Son, and Spirit. The Father, to put it a different way, eternally begets the Son, and the Son e is eternally begotten, and the Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son. Swain puts it this way. It's as though he is the very breath of the mutual love of the <laughs> Father and the Son. Can you see now why the notion of analogical language is so important here? breath, begetting, eternal begetting, father, son, this does not map univocally or exactly onto human categories. How God acts in history corresponds to who God is in eternity. And for the most nerdy of nerds here, the three persons, point four, are ordered by relations of origin. So Warfield really wanted to take the sonship of Jesus and say that refers, he's right, it refers to the equality that the son has with the father and the sameness of nature. But Warfield was very nervous about affirming that there was an order of, there was a relation of origin, that the son is from or of the father or that the son is begotten by the Father, uh, potentially for Warfield, compromised the other Trinitarian affirmations. Point number five, the external operations, the way that God acts externally into creation, in creation, are congruent with their eternal relations of origin. The other chart I showed you was a chart representative of three-point Trinitarianism. It's a good chart. This chart by John Dyer is representative of five-point Trinitarianism. Let's look at it together. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. You can find this online, John Dyer, D-Y-E-E-R, Trinity chart. Theologians call this spiration or breathe. He is breathed out from the Father and the Son. The work of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is referred to an inseparable operation. Again, God is not acting as three gods. It's not a divisible work. And yet we would not say the Father died on the cross, would we? Or that the Son sent the Father. So theologians call the manner in which the Father, Son, and Spirit inseparably operate as appropriations. Why is there not a, a modern unanimity in affirming points four and five. My brothers in Christ have uh, reasonable concerns about points four and five, um, but I would push and press a bit back here on this. If we say that Jesus is eternally begotten of the Father, wouldn't that make him something less than God?
We'll get to this in a second, but Nicaea essentially answers that with a resounding no. We'll talk about that in a second. We say God is simple. If God begets God, if the Father begets the Son, does that violate the indivisible simplicity of God? Where we say there's no parts. Can God beget without partitioning himself, multiplying himself, adding to himself, diminishing himself? The concern here is that if the Son is eternally begotten of the Father, would that violate the truth that the Son, as God, has life from himself, of himself. He is ase, he is of himself. It's called divine aseity. So the concern here is that if, if Jesus is begotten of the Father, how can we say he is of himself? The short answer is that in being begotten by the Father, the Father communicated to the Son all of what it means to be God, including divine aseity. That's a if you want to pin that, come back to that in a couple of years as you kind of do laps to this content, read other books, that's okay. And does something like five-point Trinitarianism, especially when you get systematic and technical with your terminology, and when you start talking about eternal begetting of the Son, is this going beyond what Scripture permits us to say? Is this a responsible uh, conclusion of sound biblical hermeneutics, and uh, sort of cautious and humble systematics? It's a good question. I'm not going to answer it for you, but it's, I'm trying to represent my, my brothers in Christ who would take issue with points four and five. In the case of the Council of Nicaea, the central question, hear me very carefully here. The central question at the Council of Nicaea was not merely whether the Son was of the same substance as the Father. You hear that a lot? The Son is homoousios with the Father. He's of the same substance with the Father. Of the same substance with the Father. I don't think, oh, that's helpful, that's good, that's true, that's, that's, that's what was at stake, but a, a much better way to understand the Council of Nicaea is this. In light of the Son being begotten of the Father, can we still say that Jesus is from and of the same substance as the Father? Does it make sense? The Council of Nicaea took as its starting point that Jesus was begotten of the Father before all worlds, before all time, eternally begotten of the Father. And the question was, was that something that implied the inferiority or the created status of the Son? For the Arians at the Council of Nicaea, to be begotten of the Father was just another way of saying that Jesus was created. Not created like the other creatures. They say, hey, it's a special type of creation. But for the Arians, to be begotten of the Father violated divine aseity, violated divine simplicity, violated the unity of God. So for the Arians, they wanted to uphold at least a semantic affirmation that the Son was begotten of the Father. But then they had to sneak in, often through courtesy titles. Is that familiar to anybody in Utah? Courtesy language used of God that is stripped of its meaning. He's the most high for us. He's never learned anything as far as we're concerned. He's the first God. But maybe he has himself a God. Courtesy titles, courtesy language at Athanasius in the fourth century was furious with the Arians and with second generation Arians called Eunomians. He was furious with the heretics using biblical language to cloak what they meant. They were using biblical superficial semantics to, to be deceptive of and not forthright and clear about the meaning of what they meant. So the Nicene or the creedal use of extra biblical language is not intended to be unbiblical, 
but was rather meant to be a clear expression of what Scripture says, of the same usia, homoousia, of the same substance as the Father. Getting ahead of myself here. The Nicene Creed of 325 AD, we often know it through the upgrade of 381, Council of Constantinople. The Creed reads as follows, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten from the Father, only begotten, that is, from the substance of the Father. And I, I love this. It's driving home the fact that the begetting of the Son did not result in something other than God. God makes what is not God. He begets what is God. God from God. Light from light. No courtesy titles here. True God from true God. Begotten, not made of one substance with the Father. So the Council of Nicaea, in its five-point Trinitarian theology, is affirming not only the of one substance, but the begetting and the from the substance. This position is not schismatic or idiosyncratic or peripheral or, or, or fringe. This was the position. <clears throat> Sorry. Notes. This continued to be the position of the First Council of Constantinople in 381. The Council of Chalcedon in 451. Have you all ever heard of the Chal Chalcedonian definition? It's a good one to look at regarding the two natures of Jesus. The Athanasian Creed. Have you all heard of that? The Athanasian Creed. So we're talking Council of Nicaea, Council of Constantinople, Chalcedonian definition, Athanasian Creed, medieval Christianity, early Protestantism, Reformed scholasticism. It, it's a very common thread throughout uh, the expressions of Christian doctrine. This is not a fringe idea. A really good representative, uh, a representation of the uh, confessional Protestant views, and this is from the 1689, 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, which, if I could be, jockey, if I could be f uh, funny here, they're really just copying and pasting the Westminster Confession. And, and their aim is to show they're really not that different from the Presbyterians, except on baptism and a few other issues. So this, this statement here is representative, though, broadly of, of, of uh, Protestantism at the time. The Lutheran Confessions start with the creeds mm. right in front. Yeah, so Lutherans included. Sorry not to forget y'all. Well, that's all right. I skipped over the Lutheran brothers. So. In this divine and infinite being, there are three subsistences. Now, why, why would the confession not say that the three persons are each their own existence? Because that implies a distinction of being, three gods. So Christians refer to the three persons as subsistences, not existences. The Father, the Word or Son, the Holy Spirit, and here's their nod to the Nicene Creed of one substance, power and eternity, each having the whole divine essence, Yet the essence undivided, that's a nod to a divine simplicity. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is what? Eternally begotten of the Father. The Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son, all infinite, without beginning. Therefore, but one God, who is not to be divided in nature and being, again, a nod to divine simplicity, but distinguished by peculiar relative properties, I love my nerdy friends here. And personal relations, where are they going with this? The persons of the Trinity are not distinguished by divine attributes. A divine attribute speaks to what it means to be God. And so if the persons were distinguished by divine attributes, they would not all be the one God. So instead, they're distinguished by peculiar, those asymmetric mutual relations, those relative properties or personal relations. What distinguishes the Father? He's not begotten. And the Son, He is begotten of the Father. And the Spirit, He, is, he proceeds from the Father and the Son. This is a developed grammar of the Trinity, and it entirely assumes the incomprehensibility and mystery of God. 
and our utter dependence on God's analogical revelation of himself. This is an upstream doctrine with downstream implications. If one rejects five-point Trinitarianism and opts instead for a social trinity with three centers of consciousness with their own sets of mental faculties, this affects one's view of the person and two natures of Jesus. If you monkey with the Nicene Creed, you end up having to monkey with the Chalcedonian definition of the two natures of Jesus. If you define a person as a center of consciousness with his own will, then you have to think differently about the two natures of Jesus and the union of the person. And you have to think differently about salvation. It, it does affect downstream. It's a distributed doctrine. Consider again how this systematically affects the positions of Tim Stratton. Quote, just as I see no need to appeal to mystery regarding the Trinity. That's breathtaking. I do not, I also do not think it is necessary to punt to mystery. Do you see now why I started with, for us, mystery and incomprehensibility is not a fallback or something we resort to. It's something we doxologically start with as our foundation. I do not, I also do not think it is necessary to punt to mystery regarding the hypostatic union, the two natures of Jesus and the incarnation of Christ. Substance dualism provides the answer and movies like Avatar help clarify. If a popular movie allows the conceivability of the incarnation, of an incarnation where one person can fully possess two natures, then the incarnation of Christ seems to be possibly explainable. Now, I hope you can see here that the resulting position of Stratton is related to his upstream views on theology proper, his views of incomprehensibility and the role of reason in rationalizing or using one's faculties. This reflects a different approach to divine incomprehensibility the Trinity, and the two concurring natures and operations of Christ. William Lane Craig, having rejected the traditional formulations of divine simplicity and having opted for a social trinity, takes a view that diverges from the creed of the, the Chalcedonian definition. He takes a position of the two natures of Christ, more like Avatar, described as neo-Apollinarianism. I think it's Apollinarianism. Maybe you can pronounce it better than I can. Neo-Apollinarianism, where Avatar makes more sense as an analogy for how God animates the body of Jesus. In the Council of Chalcedon, uh, there's a definition, a Chalcedon definition, where Christians confess together, this one same, the same one, the person of Jesus, is perfect in deity, and the same one is perfect in humanity. The same one is true of God, is true God and true man, comprising a rational soul and body. So this is where you're going to get a theology of the two wills of Christ united in one person. Because a will in classic Trinitarianism is proper to nature, not distinctive to the person. If you think a will or a sin of consciousness is proper to person and not to nature, then when it comes to the two natures of Christ united in one person, you end up having to do something like Avatar, uh, where you, you have Neo-Apollinarianism. OK. Whew. Let's wrap this up. My personal plea would that be Nicene Trinitarianism is incompatible with hyper-rationalistic <coughs> apologetic, apologetics. Nicene Trinitarianism starts with God's incomprehensibility. I love this language. It safeguards mystery. Mystery is not something for us to resolve. In fact, every single major Christian doctrine 
involves incomprehensible mystery. Christian doctrine doesn't eliminate the mystery. It magnifies and safeguards and revels in the mystery. To clearly state doctrine is to receive what God has spoken, to summarize it, and to confess it doxologically, in love with the mystery. It's to adore the mystery, something that you marvel at, that arrests you, that overwhelms you, and provokes you to worship. Nicene Trinitarianism requires using our mental faculties to do analogical reasoning with what God has given us to work with. It submits to the authority of Scripture. The Trinity is acid to arrogance. It, it smokes out idolatry. It requires a bending of the intellectual knee. You submit before God's revelation. You, you bend the knee. You receive. You, you submit and you trust and you believe. And it's a miracle. So evangelism for me is not about making it less miraculous. It's about faithful representation of what scripture says, kindly explaining what can be explained, but really trusting in the miracle of faith, the work of God in the heart to see what can only be seen by the illuminating light of the incomprehensible God. The doctrine of the Trinity forces the issue of humility. We, we cannot do doctrine as a f solo freelance project. We're not smart enough we need to interpret scripture in community with the help of other gifted men today and throughout Christian history. We must let scripture interpret scripture. God is one God and scripture has a single divine, unified, coherent, continuous voice. So the best interpreter of scripture is scripture. God interprets God. We are utterly dependent on God's self-revelation and on faith seeking understanding as a miracle. As a reminder, there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between creatures and the Trinity. It is not something you could invent, even if you wanted to. You would not come up with it on your own. God himself says in Isaiah 46, to whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be alike? So if this is all too much for you, just walk away with just this. The Trinity is three divine persons. The Father has always begotten the Son. And the Son has always been the Son. And in light of this, the Father sent the Son. This is not a mystery to resent or resolve or punt to or diminish. This is a mystery to adore. And if you remember, we started with a song. Father, I adore you. Jesus, I adore you. Spirit, I adore you.